then like having other people who have the same goals as you, right? Like you can so easily be stuck in someone's negative, you know, aura if they're complaining about it and they're like, I'm never going to do this. And you're like, yeah, me neither. But if you have someone like, hey, Karen, like shut the hell up, like just go and get your shit done like tomorrow, you know, it's such, it's such a difference depending on who you talk to. So I always make sure that I'm surrounded by people who have that same energy because it's so easy to get in a funk if someone else is kind of trying to pull you down with them. The Perspective Podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, we break down the art of healthy hustling, overcoming the inner critic, and growing your creative business. PC family, we have my homegirl, Karen Nguyen, the treat box baking queen on the show, and I've been practicing her last name. Welcome, Karen. How have you been? Good. Thank you for having me. And you did it perfect. So I'm I'm impressed by it. <laughs> I've only been butchering it wrong for about two years. And then people I went to college with had the same last name, and I've been butchering their name wrong the whole nobody ever corrected me. So I'm glad I asked. Um Fun fact about this today, you have been on my list of people I've been scouting. Like I scout out here, like, like I'm back in like football coaching, you know, scouting players in the region. But I want to give a huge shout out to my wifey. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Emily mentioned like, hey, dude, you know who you should have on your podcast? She'll mention people from time to time that she pays attention to too. And she's like, Karen. And I was like, dude, she's on my list. Okay, let's make it happen. So she affirmed what I would was believing. And yeah, you're here today. That's so awesome. And as soon as you texted me, I was like, there was no question. I was like, yeah, there was no hesitation because I listen to your podcast and I love it. But, you know, I wouldn't be the type to be like, hey, can I be on your podcast? <laughs> yeah, and I get asked a lot from people in a gross way. So it's just like weird. I'd rather just go out and like study people who I feel like would be a good fit. And like, thankfully, um, you're always been around like Clubhouse and you just mm-hmm. through some of my sessions. And I was like, okay wait, she's in here. Let me invite her on stage real quick to uh, shoot the shit. And I'm like, okay, yep. That was like the other little ticker. I'm like, okay, I'm planting a little seed right here, getting a vibe. And then Emily, like a week later was like, dude, you should have her. I'm like, dude, yes. Okay. And for those um, who may not know about you, well, before we go Wikipedia page summary, how we met <laughs> was 2019 Summit of Greatness, right? Lewis House yeah. Summit of Greatness. Yeah. Like, was it 2019 or before that? Was it, what was the first it was, year? Was 2018. Yeah, we met yeah. before Emily went with me. Yep. And then 2019, we all got to mm-hmm. kick it even more. So, wow. It's uh to me, that just like shows the power of relationships and going out and about meeting people. And yeah, look at us now connected all these years later. And now you're on the podcast. So um, it's yeah. been just super dope watching you make moves behind the scenes all year and scaling your business, which we can get into to now. Um, so if you can give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself. Oh man, Wikipedia page. I hate this like elevator pitch. Like, you know, when you're on Clubhouse, you got to talk about yourself. But yeah, essentially, um, you know, I I go by Sweet Afternoon on Instagram and TikTok. Um, I'm a baker based out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You know, I started baking always just like as a hobby growing up and more casually just like as a creative outlet. Um, but I got more serious into it around 2018, actually closer to like when we had met, um, more again, just doing it as like a hobby when people would ask me to bake for them. Um, but I never really thought of it as a a side hustle or something that I wanted to continue to monetize and grow. Um, but here I am now, like being able to now ship across Canada with like my treat boxes. Uh, it was definitely a great pivot you know, with the pandemic, because I was able to now expand my audience across Canada. Um, So that's kind of what I do. I still work full time. But I definitely feel like this side hustle is also my full time job, because I'm so, you know, it's always in my mind at all given times, I'm always doing business related things. Um, Yeah, and that's, that's who I am. That's my little Wikipedia page, I would say. What is your day job? (laughs) So I'm an account manager um, for HR platform, HR benefits, payroll platform based in Canada. I actually, tomorrow is my four year anniversary with the the company. Um, I started, you know, I was recruited as a workplace wellness (laughs) uh, professional 
Um, and then I moved more onto the client experience side and then, you know, client success. So I do a lot of like account management with clients and I love my team and I love my company. And I think that is why I love having it as, you know, my full time still, but also with Sweet Afternoon being my creative side hustle because I can have that two, you know, balancing each other. Well, and something else before we like really dive into the side hustle is you're big into fitness too. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, like, how the hell do you create treats and bake all day and manage to stay fit? Like, to me, that's insane discipline. If I worked at like a pizza shop or a pizza delivery boy, I'd look like a pizza. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's different because, you know, I'm baking and creating for other people. Whereas, you know, of course I'm doing recipe testing. I'm, you know, creating content and baking all these goods, but really I look, I look back into like, what is my actual goal, like long-term? And yeah, I think about my, my fitness goals too. And it's always good to have, you know, moderation and balance. Like, I'm not going to lie and sit here and be like, I don't eat anything that I bake. Like, this is not who I am, but I do. I do have your own supply over there. Yeah. Yeah. You got to quality assurance, right? You got to make sure (laughs) that whatever you're baking is good enough for, you know, other people. Uh, But like I mentioned, I don't, you know, indulge to the point where I feel sick it's just more like quality and I have a coach too who makes sure that I'm like accountable and have, sticking to my goals a fitness nutrition coach like I have one too it's been yeah. the best thing I've ever invested in besides Honestly, like an iPad and my MacBook so yeah like if you're someone who's always go 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 and you know that it may not be a priority for you to like go to the gym you know work on your nutrition having someone else there just to tell you how to do it and when to do it and making sure you do it is so key. I've worked with him since like 2018 as well. And best investment ever. Yeah. I'll be having my coach Mm -hmm. on here to speak towards that. But like, dude, I'm a coach who will always have a coach. It's like, how are you going to go to a doctor who doesn't go and see a doctor? You know, doesn't believe in seeing doctors. So it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm big on how can I have a guide in my life? But in like, you did powerlifting and stuff too before mm-hmm. like lockdowns and stuff in your realm. So like check out Karen, she's legit. And I really, really like, uh, I wanted to make sure to touch on that just because so many creatives get so obsessed with the hustle, hustle, hustle and the grind, 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 mm-hmm. which I am guilty of. That used to be me, but I'm about the healthy hustle now. And I'm way more um, respectful of people who put self-care and fitness first, because that just makes you more creative, gives you more mm-hmm. energy, more focus. And happiness when you get down on the side hustle. It's yeah. Balancing it goes, the world of your day job with your side hustle way more easier. Yeah. It goes like full circle, right? Like if you feel good, you're, you're able to work more, you're able to be creative, you know, you're, you're physically there, you know what I mean? Um, so I truly like believe like in a balance of, you know, grind and hustle, all of that, but also still prioritize like your mental health, your physical health, you know, eating right, sleeping, Um, and all of that, because it is going to, in the long run, improve, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, whether it be your full-time job or like your creative side hustle. Yeah. I think two things you mentioned right there, get off your ass as ex creatives and Mm -hmm. get some sleep. I was good about getting off my ass well and eating right, but like I struggled in the nutrition and I struggled with the sleeping. So I guarantee most people don't want to hear this, but I feel like they need to hear it. And then one day they'll thank us for hearing this. So um, Mm -hmm. speak back to your side hustle again. How did you get into baking as a hobby? And when did you see like the opportunity to take this from a hobby to a side hustle? And then I want to talk about like how we, how you scaled it, monetized it, made it profitable. Um, But when did you know like this could turn into something? I think it. I knew when it could turn into something when I had people outside of like my family and friends asking for me to bake them something, you know, I think it's easy to stay a hobby. What made you when, start baking in the first place and then sharing it on social media for people to even see that this is something mm-hmm. they could hit you up on. I remember it was like a random weekend. You know, I think I was just mentally drained from work that I needed to do something like, you know, with my hands and, maybe I was watching like YouTube videos of people just baking and I was like, Hey, I'm going to try this. And it was like a box mix cake. I didn't even try and make something from scratch. Um, and I took pictures of it and I had it on my personal Instagram, just like, Hey guys, like, this is what I did on the weekend. And 
I kind of just like, I think I was so competitive with myself where I was like, okay, I'm going to try and do something better and nicer and maybe let's try like using, trying out a, a real recipe and, you know, tweaking it. And then I would bring it into my workplace because, you know, I had like three cakes on a weekend. Like, what the heck am I going to do with three cakes? So I brought them into my workplace and, you know, it would be occasions where someone's birthday is next week and I would be volunteering to make a cake because, hey, I want to practice, but also a good opportunity just to not have a cake laying around in my house all the time. Um, And then it was word of mouth. You know, people were like, hey, you know, my cousin has a birthday. Are you able to make something? And then once I started sharing it on social media, um, I got a lot of people pushing me to be like, hey, you know, you should keep sharing it and see what happens. Um, you enjoying and, it, right? Like it just, exactly. just found an outlet that you're like, what the hell? I just want to make a cake one day. Yeah, it was, so random. it was out of boredom. And it wasn't like my intention was, hey, I'm going to make a cake to sell and make money. It was just natural that I enjoyed it. And I just put it out there and other people enjoyed it. Um, and I created a separate Instagram account because I was all in on my fitness, you know, I didn't want to be that person. And this is something that like I struggled squats with. And back cakes. Then. Squats yeah, and cakes. like squats and cakes. And, you know, I think people followed on my personal account to see fitness and then randomly it's like, Hey, now you're baking. Like, this is not what Confusing. I want. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, people drop off. So I created the separate baking account and it kind of just, you know, Uh, went from there people were just contacting me to make more treats for them and at that point I was like okay I need to start taking it seriously like a business start creating real invoices start you know quoting people real prices not like first cake charge like what do you charge for your first thing it was like 30 bucks like barely anything right it was like I thought that was a reasonable price because I was comparing myself to like, you know, what someone would buy at a grocery store, but didn't realize like, no, you know, you're putting your personal time and touch to it. Like that, that doesn't even cost like material at that point. Um, Yeah. So it was like a $30 cake and I kept that price for quite some time until people were giving me feedback saying, Hey, Karen, like you should charge way more. And I think it's that's like something that I was charging a $50 logo in the beginning. I'm yeah. Like, oh my God. I feel like I'm ripping someone off. I didn't understand the value of what I was creating for someone. Yeah. And I think people are scared to overprice, right? Because they're worried about someone else's budget, right? It's like, and no, someone like might this, think of them. Yeah. Or like, you're not worthy of this particular price, but you know, at the end of the day, like you're putting in so much of your time and effort that you do need to price yourself appropriately. Um, and it did take me a long time to get to that point, but yeah, it was, it was a slow start (laughs) in terms of like monetization, but here I am. (laughs) Right. So if you don't mind me asking, you said you're transparent about everything. Yeah. What did you make in like 2018? What were you able to make in 2019? And what have you scaled it you know, like today by the years, Mm -hmm. just so people can see like, yo, it starts from zero. Everybody starts Mm -hmm. at zero, but everybody wants to be uh, the pressure to monetize their shit right Mm -hmm. from the jump. And I'm like, okay, people know enough about my story of how it's grown each year and doubled, but Mm -hmm. I would love for you if you're okay with sharing your numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have like annual figures um, offhand, but I'll kind of give Maybe just a little bit of back- range. Yeah, like a background for people who don't know. So I used to just strictly make cakes, right? It was like two cakes a week, two cakes a month. Like it was very inconsistent. Um, so 2018, I would probably just generate like less than 500 a month. Like it was very, very little, right? It was like barely a side bucks hustle. Or a Canadian, what, what's Canadian? Uh, I don't know. The Canadian. It would probably be like 400 US. <laughs> To be okay, honest, okay, yeah, no, it wasn't I'm like much. at first it was like 500 cakes, but no, 500, no, no, 500 dollars, oh, yeah, Canadian dollars. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Canadian okay. dollars, yeah. So it wasn't much at all, and each month could be very cons- inconsistent, right? One month I could do nothing, one month it could be half of that. So 2018 was like barely, barely anything to even consider a business, like maybe a couple um, thousand that year, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. and then that's, that's 2000. Yeah. In 2019 is when I started to pivot into these treat boxes where I would ship, you know, 
blondies, brownies across Canada. And I kind of dabbled into the US. And that's when I was able to make a steady number of boxes per month. Like I knew I would be able to generate, you know, X number of boxes. So in 2019, I would say that I... And for those watching the YouTube or the YouTube... For those watching the video of this conversation, I'm on, God, dude, this is, I thank God I had myself a little protein heavy snack so I didn't come <laughs> in here with all these cravings. Yeah, me and my wife, like, will scroll through your page and be like, I wish she would send this shit to the United States now. Sorry, continue, yeah. please. Just so they no, can no. the treat boxes and the cakes. Yeah. So, and then once I started doing the treat boxes, I would only do like a couple rounds per month, like one or two, just to get, you know, an idea of how people would react to it, like kind of what the demand was. So I would say like from going from like 500 a month from just cakes, then to like or, or late 2019, it will be like, uh, like just over a grand a month. And then in 2020 is when I really went like full force with treat boxes. As you can see, like on my, my Instagram, it was like all cakes early in the days. Look at the um, presentation, <laughs> just like massively revamped so may 27th 2018 mm -hmm. crazy yeah what so pretty much three years style. yeah it's a, it's crazy just to see my journey but now 2020 and then 2021 i would say like just roughly probably just under 3k per month um just doing like treat boxes um, because I'm able again, and this is consistent. This is why I love doing the treat boxes, not just because I enjoy, you know, doing that and connecting with my community and being able to, you know, broaden my, my audience across Canada. It's because also it allows me to know, like, this is what I'm generating per month and I don't have to be worried about it. Uh, whereas like cakes, it was so like dependent on occasions depending on people's you know are they celebrating especially during lockdown it was unsure of what was going to happen next month whereas now it's like I know for sure I'm going to be generating like 2k 2 to 3k per month and that's gross because that's like gross without considering materials and everything mm -hmm, like, dude, mm -hmm. you probably have like an insane station just stacked with sprinkles and yeah. All kinds of fondue and all kinds of crazy shit, huh? Like how <laughs> me and all my other designer friends, we collect like pens. Like, oh my God, this is just one cup filled with pens and all my shit all around here. Like that's probably you with baking supplies, right? Yep, pretty much. Are your sculpting it's chaotic. tools? Yeah, it's chaotic with all the baking supplies <laughs> and packaging, you know? Dude, I would love to see like workshop station shots on your stuff too, like all your stuff, like how people just love seeing everyone's pens all laid out everywhere. Mm -hmm. like, dude, I want to see all your baking supplies. I think people would be scared. <laughs> it's a chaotic mess, right? It's a mess that I understand, whereas someone else might see it and be like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> That's hilarious. So mm -hmm. it's been a slow build of monetizing your craft, but I think people... Mm -hmm really feel like they have to figure out how to monetize it right from the jump. And you showed like, no, this just started as a hobby. Like that's mm -hmm. how it should start is it should start as a hobby. And once you really start figuring out that you like it, you find your groove, you start sharing a little bit more, start taking some requests here and there, no pressure to like make this into your full-time job or anything right from the jump. Mm -hmm. And it slowly, naturally and organically evolves on its own. And I feel like people want to cheat the process um, that's how it was for me in freelance. And then I found out freelance wasn't for me. And then that led me to the next thing, which then led me to coaching, which was my thing. Mm -hmm. um, speak to that. Do you ever feel like the pressure that it needs to be bigger? Did you ever feel that pressure? Or were you just like, yo, this is just always purposeful play that I'm just being more intentional and strategic about. And then it's just like the demand is growing. Yeah. So I think a little bit of both. I think, you know, as someone who has a business, you're always thinking ahead, like, how can I grow? How can I scale? Like, what are my next steps? But I think like with the way that I started, you know, I always focus on community. Like I want to be engaged with like my customers. Right. And I didn't want it to be where it was obvious that I was trying to, you know, gain all these customers, gain, you know, all this money from what I'm doing. It was always, you know, I still want to share value. I still want to teach people 
you know, how to do certain techniques. I want to show them behind the scenes. I want them to be part of my journey. And I always wanted it to be like purposeful and intentional, right? I didn't want it to be, you know, like a, a shark, right? Like jumping right from the gun, like, hey, buy everything so that I can scale and make all this money. Like, no, I, but it's still in my mind, like, what are my next steps? Like, how can I evolve and, you know, build upon my business? But I definitely, like, my number one like, value <laughs> is my community and ensuring that they're still feeling part of me versus, like, now that I'm at this point, I don't care about them, right? And I feel like you crush it in terms of people over profit. And I feel like when mm-hmm. we put people over profit, profit is just a byproduct, you know, a mm-hmm. happy con- a coincidence. So could you talk a little bit about how you do engage your community when it's not just like an order, a custom order from a client? What are some of the, the tips and tricks that you do to engage your community to give them a voice to feel like they're co-collaborators in the stuff that you bake? Yeah. So if we're talking like social media, of course, like using all of the engagement tools, like I do sticker polls on my story. I do like the question box, like asking people for their feedback or give like a scenario what you do, like, isn't it like every Wednesday or. Yeah. So every Wednesday I do a, which would you choose poll? So I'll do like 10 slides of like two different, you know, food products and ask people, which would they choose this one or that one? And I've been doing that for over two years, every single week on Wednesday. And my audience like loves it. They always reply and saying like, you know, they have banters with their partner because they didn't agree with something. And it was just like a fun way for them to feel like they're playing a game. Like you want to gamify certain things so that they have an interaction with you um, versus like a simple slide where they're just scrolling. It has nothing for them to, to care about. Um, so I love using those engagement stickers. I love like doing polls. I love, you know, doing call to actions, right? Even if it's on my post, like asking them, what kind of cookies do you love? Like, what's your favorite cake flavor? Like getting to know them because people love talking about themselves. They love to like share, right? They I love, love to, to talk share. About myself. Oh my God, the ego <laughs> is strong in me. Yeah. So they like, if you were to ask someone like, Hey, what's your favorite pizza on your post? I'm sure so many people will run and be like, I love this. I love that versus, you know, something that is related to me, right? I want to get to know my audience. And I think people enjoy that. Um, And it's just like engaging in the DMs, like behind the scenes, not just like replying to comments. It's also like messaging them, um, and, you know, ensuring that I reply to them with like genuine conversations, not just a simple, like, thank you. Or it's a, like a thumbs up emoji. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. tip I talk about in like my engaged community building video course that you do the biggest secret to getting people to care about what you do is to show that you care about them first. Exactly. And like getting to know your community is like a huge way of getting people to care about you. You know, you're not just mm-hmm. the person who makes dope treat boxes. Like you are Karen, mm-hmm. you know, that they get to know. And I think that's a powerful thing. Yeah. And I think people want to support the person behind the brand, right? There's, you can buy brownies and blondies from anyone. You can go to the damn grocery store and buy a $10, you know, pack of 10 million brownies, right? But they want to buy from you because they know who you are. They know what you're about. They know like, what you're doing behind the scenes. So I think that's really important for like a personal brand, like a a small business is to show like who you are because yeah, anyone could be, you know, anyone could be a a baker, right? It's just like, are they buying from you because they like you or are they buying from you because, you know, your brownies are great, but there's someone else who can do it. Right. I'm huge, huge. You nailed it on top of the head for sure it's it's we live in a world that's so saturated with content creators Mm -hmm. and saturated with gross people trying to like snake oil salesmen or just like promote themselves in a gross sleazy way and there's always ads being bombarded so it's hard to like how do you rise above the noise and to me like the secret sauce is you what you're doing right now i like powerlifting i like all this stuff but i like baking and caking Mm -hmm. and getting my audience involved with it thinking of like ways to gamify it But more important, it's like you're leaving your unique thumbprint and people get to uh, connect the incredible work 
and the tasty work that you do with the face, you know, it makes it way mm-hmm. easier for people to not only support the work you're doing, but the human behind it. And it's like, that's what I want to teach my students. Like, well, let's rise above the noise by being personal in your personal brand. Mm-hmm, Even if mm-hmm. you don't like the word personal brand, like, dude, you're a fucking personal brand, regardless if you want to admit it or not. Like we all are, Yeah. whether we're content creators or we're just everyday normal people in our neighborhood. Yeah. And something that kind of like a, an example is I was rarely sharing my like workouts on my story. I was rarely sharing like my powerlifting because, you know, again, people go to your page because they follow your content. They don't really see like your stories until they actually follow you. Yeah. Um, but I got so much feedback on like my workouts. They love to see it. They they ask questions about it. And it it feels like they can resonate because. So you'd show like everyone. a little less curated, hyper curation exactly. your stories. Like that to me is like a place where you can show a little bit more about yourself and your interests, your passions, your values, your secret sauce in a sense. Yeah. I know there's so many people are like, no, like just keep it strictly like baking, just keep it strictly like your products and your business. But I was like, no, because this is part of my, my brand. Like I, I work out, you know, and I feel like that's a good way to motivate people also to work out. And they see, you know, I can have a business, I can work out, I can have a personal life. Um, And I think that's the key why people kind of maybe, you know, resonate with me because they also enjoy working out and they, you find like, wow, this is crazy that you're also a baker and you work out. So you can do it all. Like, I I feel like you shouldn't limit yourself to like one box, one pillar of content. It's like professional, personal. Like, I think it's okay to share. It's your platform. Do whatever you feel like is, is appropriate. But I think really for me, like a really key point was when I started sharing more of my personal side that a lot of people felt more like a community. Yeah. They feel more connected to you. I feel like a photo shoot in the future of you and like your powerlifting attire on like oh a boy. treadmill with three of your treats in your hands, just like smashing. That would be hilarious. That would be great episode artwork. I'm just saying. Yeah. Well, once gym's open here, so. <laughs> yeah, speaking towards that, that's another thing I want to talk about. So pandemic in Canada has been just nuts. So some of my mm-hmm. students are from Canada and like, yeah, we're on our like 18,000th lockdown right now. And it's really doing a number on my mental health. So gyms are locked down. Like I tried working out. Thankfully, like Iowa has just been uh, pretty against the grain on certain things. Mm-hmm. We've opened up gyms a lot sooner um, than most people. So I only was in like lockdown for maybe a month or so without mm-hmm. the gym. And I worked out from home. It sucked. It absolutely mm-hmm. sucked. So how did you, from a mindset, when shit all locked down, how did you stay in shape and then really take your business to the next level while still managing a day job? Because I know you're not mm-hmm. married, you don't have kids. So there is an advantage mm-hmm. towards someone like me. Um, but still, like that's a lot on your plate and a lot of things to mentally navigate, especially just your time now. You have more time to yourself. Most people yeah. are just like, I don't know how to manage my time. Clearly, I feel like that is like a superpower of yours. Yeah. So I'm really into time management and, you know, actually creating a schedule and writing things down as to like when I'm doing something and at what given time. I think again, if you're someone who's very overwhelmed, someone who's like busy body, like just can't stay organized, like writing it down and having like a to-do list. So in terms of like working out and like the motivation, like, yes, it was really difficult in the beginning of lockdown, you know, using the gym was always my excuse to like be in a different environment, you know, kind of escape from my day job and like my business. It was like me time and not having that was definitely a struggle. But again, having my coach there just to, to keep me sane, you know, giving me some kind of goal to work towards. I think having a goal is super key um, because if you're just working out just to like do it, I feel like you need something to kind of be a a different kind of motivation, whether it be, Hey, you know, I'm going to try and aim for like 5k run. Like I'm training for that, or I'm going to work towards a 250 pound squat. I needed something to have a target to measure. Yeah, exactly. We need carrots to chase. If we don't have carrots to chase, we wake up with no reason to do anything. Yeah, exactly. And having other people, right, that I knew are in the same struggle, having that kind of bond with someone else to like, know, like, okay, we're going to do this together. Let's work out tomorrow. Like, not together, but, you know, 7pm, we're going to do it. And 
I think like for me, it was again, just going back to remembering what my priorities are, like not letting myself sink into this like whole because we're in lockdown, like everywhere is having these struggles, right? It's not just me. Like I couldn't take it personally. I have to just keep going. Um, and same thing for my business. Like I had to remember, you know, people don't really care what you're going through personally, right? In some manner, like, yes, if you wanted to take a break, that's totally okay. But you have to show up, right? You have to be consistent in your business. Um, and that's like a, kind of like the, the number one factor for a lot of things is being consistent. Um, I think it's easy to, you know, be off for a couple of days and then slide into that funk where you're just stopping for two months, you're stopping for three months and kind of letting it roll and losing momentum. So kind of it's making sure that, again, I think back to what my priorities were. And I think I had to use that as my motivation. I couldn't rely on, you know, other things. It was like honing back into personally, like what I was trying to achieve. And I couldn't let, you know, lockdown get in the way. So I did whatever I use like my KitchenAid mixer as a weight. <laughs> I didn't have like equipment. So I was using bags of flour. I was like, again, making it funny and sharing it on my story and kind of using that as like a motivation. Man. So personally driven, having targets, making sure you're around community and having some sort of guide to like keep you accountable, which mm -hmm. I love it. You know, cause a lot of people don't check any of those boxes and then they wonder why they're not winning. And then mm -hmm. they self-sabotage themselves and be destructive versus productive, mm -hmm. you know, and constructive think, with what they do. And like having other people who have the same goals as you, right? Like you can so easily be stuck in someone's negative, you know, aura if they're complaining about it and they're like, I'm never going to do this. And you're like, yeah, me neither. But if you have someone like, hey, Karen, like shut the hell up, like just go and get your shit done like tomorrow, you know, it's such, it's such a difference depending on who you talk to. So I always make sure that I'm surrounded by people who have that same energy because it's so easy to get in a funk if someone else is kind of trying to pull you down with them. Yeah. Like I call it trimming the fat in your life. And I've had to trim a lot <laughs> yeah. of it. It's like, yeah, all the local shit I used to kick it with. It's a negative black hole where ambition and dreams are destroyed. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I need to like get on my own path and find my community out at conferences and then internet, like get going to like Lewis house was like way different experience mm -hmm. where I got to meet people like you who are necessarily weren't designers or anything like that. And you're creative in your own outlet, which is dope. So, um, <clears throat> during the pandemic then, is that where TikTok really blew out? Cause as of today, when I was mm -hmm. looking, it's like, oh my God, you're cracking like the hundred K over there. Oh, blowing well. up over on TikTok. I see. Yeah. It. I don't, I'm not so, on TikTok. Wife every night's like, oh my God, you got to see this video on TikTok. I'm like, I'm not on TikTok <laughs> right now, but I'll watch it. You gotta. I, pay you attention gotta. To you. I always, I always try and push people who are a personal brand or, you know, a creative to be on TikTok because it's just another platform. You just reuse your, your current content and move it over there and have a different audience. Right. Um, so yes, I, <laughs> it's like you create, two, you create multiple types of content. Yeah. So it's like very uncurated. It's all like behind the scenes, like little snippets of my content, Damn, that but one, uh, that one banged. Yeah. During, during the pandemic is when I kind of went full force with TikTok. Like every single day I posted a video still consistently. There was times where I did, you know, two videos per day and you can see like my views aren't that high, but early on, like I would hit like a million views. I would hit like 500 K I would hit like Damn, that all these numbers. Damn. Yeah. I got a lot of hate on those videos. <laughs> For what? You know, people just don't agree with certain combinations. Cause I, I made flaming hot Cheetos with marshmallows. Um, and it just triggered a lot of people's uh, people. Yeah. It like was very just, triggering. They just didn't like, the combination, the combination. It. yeah it wasn't like hey you're promoting bad, bad nutrition no it was strictly just the combination um just but her and felt like people needed to know their opinion of why they don't like it like what? yeah people yeah are ridiculous but hey the more comments 
the more you're doing something right. Engagement. You know? yeah. yeah. And you know, you gotta use, I mean, everybody's going to get hate some way or another mm-hmm. and you just can't let it affect you. Like I just use it as a, a way to engage with people. I, I respond in funny ways. Like I just don't let that get to me emotionally. Um, and you're right. It's like, use it as an engagement tool and firing your, your fuel to, to create even different content. Um, that means you're not playing it safe. If you're getting someone who's giving you a negative comment, uh, comment, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, people who are trolls, they're really the sad ones in life. Like mm-hmm. we should feel sorry for them. So yeah, mm-hmm. I've had some really negative things said to me in the past, but just roll with it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, TikTok has been a different platform that I really enjoy. Again, building a different audience there. It's What's a whole the different audience you're market. building there. Describe the two different audiences. So Instagram is definitely more people within my same niche, you know, and also people who are actually going to convert into sales. Whereas I feel like TikTok is more for like entertainment. Uh, and building the brand awareness, I don't necessarily, you know, would convert a lot of sales from TikTok, but it is building like, you know, a, a community of people who just enjoy like the entertainment value of what I do. Um, and like, you know, other small business behind the scenes kind of um, uh, content. Um, so I don't necessarily try and sell on TikTok. Whereas like Instagram, I would push more of like my products. I would push more of like- Strictly entertainment. People who like that oddly satisfying stuff or, I mean, it's kind of educational too. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely show like more, I guess, like tips and such on TikTok because I know it's going to be more like value-based content, entertainment. Um, And again, I just rarely try and sell anything on TikTok and- I think, but, the, but then people like they want more. They'll go over to your Instagram and find Instagram, you yeah. There, you know, like your off your audience just gets siphoned off. Yeah, exactly. And funny enough, I get more brands reaching out to me through TikTok than Instagram. I think the reach is a lot broader on TikTok. For sure, um, they haven't like the algorithm hasn't killed organic reach yet. Like, dude, you exactly. have one <laughs> post out of ten, each one gets a couple thousand, and this one bangs out of nowhere for a million. Yeah, exactly. So I always like to promote people to, or motivate them to use TikTok, even if there's no intention of, you know, trying to sell anything. It's just a different audience that you can build and add to your community. God, inspire me to get my ass back on it. The pandemic like shut me down. I was doing it like daily. Yeah. I had I found kiddos that- come back home. Like my, my son ended up coming home and then wifey ended up working from home. So it's like, it's totally threw my schedule off. But, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> A I'm lot of my content, for sure. <laughs> a lot of my content is just from my stories on Instagram, right? I would just like reuse the content that I was using on Instagram and over to TikTok. So I just wasn't download making it from your stories and then upload it right back over here. Yeah, it wasn't like I was recreating new content for TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. Because I feel like that could be a different workload where I was just recycling content that I already had, right? We're all sitting on, you know, a a landmine of content I'm sure on our phones that we can just go and recycle on TikTok. So like these little snippets, you're not recording these natively within TikTok. Are you just doing a little snippet on Instagram stories, Instagram. little mm-hmm. snippet on Instagram stories, and then you just download the stories as the full video and then upload that full video? Yeah. So okay. I either okay. have it raw on my camera roll, like I'm just taking um, videos like normally or it's from my Instagram stories. Yeah, it's like either way, I'm never natively creating content through the TikTok app. Okay, that's good to know. So like, <laughs> are you just using Hyperlapse on Instagram stories or actually like Hyperlapse app? This is, yeah. So this is something that I would have just sped up on InShot. InShot, what's InShot? Is that an app? Yeah, it's a video editing app. So you can speed things up uh, like you know, two times speed, okay. five times speed. You can add voiceovers on InShot. Um, so it's like just little, do you have like a, a, a stand and everything too that you're shooting this on with like a, um, a Bluetooth? Yeah, yeah. it's just, just tripod. Shutter? Honestly, okay. it's just like a, a Amazon tripod. Just plop my phone on there. Everything is shot on my phone. Um, so it's like so easy just to like put your content out there. And TikTok is so, 
I've tested different formats of content and TikTok likes like raw, you know, not photo styled and edited in like a perfect way. Highly um, curated blogger style shit. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is all super, super helpful for people to figure out how can they just repurpose content um, real easy. But I feel like we've covered a lot of how you built this profitable business, how to make time to still get into self-care <clears throat> and mental health, physical health, um, how to leverage social media to um, hit different kind of audiences and repurpose your content. Uh, I want to finish this off with some rapid fire fun questions if you're down. Yeah, I was nervous about this. Not nervous, but I was like, ooh, what's it going to be? But yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> by rapid, they probably will include some tangents. But uh, if you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? I knew this question was coming up. <laughs> so I'm going to say it's going to be a barbecue sauce pizza with crumbled like sausage and mushrooms and just like regular like mozzarella cheese. Okay. I'm a barbecue based. No, it could be like Domino's. Yeah, it could be or Vagon's Domino's. It could be Pizza Hut. Like, I don't really care. It's just, I I really enjoy like the barbecue sauce base. See, we get down with some barbecue sauce, which is like (laughs) pepperoni and barbecue, maybe some bacon. But I have not been having pizza this year. Like it's, oh my God, it's been paying off. But man, it's been very, very, very difficult. Um, What's your go-to treat box or flavor? that you love creating the most or is the most popular, most requested? So I enjoy making the Funfetti like ultimate birthday cake one. I think it's because that was the one that kind of started it all. I don't know if you remember at Lewis House, like some of the greatness, I handed it out as like a business card. Yeah, so I think I enjoy that because that is the, the one thing that started it all. And it kind of like aligns with my brand, but I think the one that gets like the most requests is the Ruffles Marshmallow Square because it's such a weird combination that people get curious about. Salt and, and they're sweet. all yeah, and they're always surprised about it. Um, so I like to use that as like you know the the kind of the key thing that makes me different. Um, so it's kind of like both of them. <laughs> it's funny. I'm over at conferences handing out sticker packs and shit, and you're handing out brownies. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. that's what makes us do- i remember your i have your stickers still and that was like the one thing that i remembered you from because you handed out sticker packs like nobody else there was doing that no like, everybody else is like business cards but you got brownies and i got sticker <laughs> you got packs. stickers like, yeah, we hit it off we hit it off <laughs> um let's see if if you were standing on an island what are the three things you would have to have to refrain from dying from boredom because it's like you really can't bake oh shit uh Wow. Three things, right? Yeah. Um, I would probably bring a book. So that's a very boring question, but I do enjoy reading. I love like kind of like personal development books. I love, you know, like business books. Um, and oh, what else? I'm the type of person who doesn't really need anything physical to have fun. Like I can probably walk around this island and be content and not bored like i'll go explore like what is in the sand like let's go look at these trees so some hiking shoes then to protect yeah yeah yeah, okay yeah perfect some hiking shoes and maybe like friggin sunscreen (laughs) (laughs) Uh, endless supply okay okay this is a fun one what's your go-to um personal development book and what's your go-to business recommendation book um so personal development is the compound effect um that's a really that is one that my actual coach like my um fitness coach gave to me um and it was always he always said like it was a book that you just kind of keep sending it to someone else next like you don't keep it you give it away um so the compound effect for like personal development kind of like growth and also relentless is a really good one um it's essentially that like teaching you how to be relentless in your personal life and your business. So that's kind of like a business book, I would say. Um, It's like half personal development, half business. Um, So those two books is what I would recommend. Business book. Oh, I don't know. I can't think of the top of my mind. Anything with Gary V or like Grant Cardone. Okay. I would say. Cool. Grant Cardone's um, 
like what is his what is his book grant cardone's um no 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 no. it's like uh un for i don't know i can't remember to be honest just go look <laughs> up grant cardone like i've yeah, I've yeah. a couple of his things too and obviously i'm a huge gary v fan grant cardone Ooh, my keyboard spazzed out sorry if there's like random uh typing no, you're yeah, good. I've been doing random typing this whole time with you too. Something about B average or gosh, he's got a couple of them. Yeah, he has so many. Um, be obsessed or be average. There you go. Yep. Be yeah. obsessed or be average. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last one. Where can people go to find you online, support you? And where are your treat boxes available? <laughs> So you can find me on Instagram and TikTok under Sweet Afternoon. So at Sweet Afternoon. And my treat boxes are available in Canada right now only. So anywhere in Canada. But slowly, hopefully soon, we'll start tapping into the U.S. market. Yeah, please. (laughs) Come on. We're wanting some stuff over here. I know. I bet you like shipping is just a nightmare. It is in a way because you have to go through like customs and like declare value and it's always iffy during these times about like food shipping. Um, so that's kind of like the only reason why I haven't really started shipping to the U S is because especially with COVID, they're more cautious about like what hopes to jump through right now, but eventually future state that's scalable, right? Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I'm really, really stoked that we finally got a chance to make this happen. You crushed it and, uh, let's keep in touch. I can't wait to drop this one. Yay. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.